Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Angela Ku, and on behalf of the Chicago Quantum Exchange, I am pleased to welcome you to the second day of our Chicago Quantum Summit and the Boeing Quantum Creators Prize Symposium. So I'm just gonna make a few remarks about the history of our um, Quantum Creators Prize. So the Boeing Quantum Creators Prize began in 2021 as an opportunity to recognize early career scientists producing outstanding and promising research in the fields of quantum science and engineering. In the last three years, we've awarded this prize to 41 grad students and postdocs who have been exploring new ideas in their respective fields. For the winners, it's a recognition of their amazing achievements, and for us, it's an opportunity to learn about all the latest and greatest developments that are going on in quantum science and engineering from the actual researchers doing the work. So today you'll hear about the research of the 14 winners of this year's prize. Our winners have careers that span six countries and 18 institutions. This 2023 cohort is incredibly strong and I'm super excited to hear about their research. We really believe that this class will become future leaders in their field. So we will be hosting presentations in three groups spread out throughout the day, including quantum information and networks, complexity and metrology, and novel quantum systems. This year, we're also honored to be partnered with the Boeing Company, which recently committed more than $3.5 million to the Chicago Quantum Exchange Collaboration that supports research and education, including this prize over the next five years, so that we can continue doing, having this symposium, and we're really grateful for their support. So before we hear from our first group of 2023 Boeing Quantum Creators Prize winners, we're gonna, I'd like to invite Jay Lowell, who is Chief Engineer of Boeing's Disruptive Computing Networks and Sensors to share his perspective. So please give a round of applause for Jay. Thanks, and just to be clear, this is the first year that we've called it the Boeing Prize, and. So we're trying to, we want to support this and we are doing this for shameless self-promotion, but as well, we really do think that it's important to uh, to have this prize out there. Um, I wanted to talk for a minute, if you forgive me, on, on why we want to do that, because I think that's, um, to me, that's, that's what's important here. Um, as a company, Boeing is committed to innovation. We've been committed to that over our hundred and, <clears throat> hundred and some years of corporate existence, innovation drives our company forward in making better products, safer products that connect, protect, and explore the world and bring people together. And we think that these technologies are the kinds of technologies that will help us do that mission better. And so we're invested in the long term in making the taking the research and the output of the research that people are doing today and turning those into products for tomorrow. Um, at the Boeing Company, we spend a lot of money on research and development, and we do that, again, because we are committed to driving the world forward and doing that mission better than we can. And um, right now, we're spending more than $3 billion a year in research and development to try to transform the aviation industry into something that is more suited to a better tomorrow than it is the present today. Um, and, and in order to do that, there are a lot of things that have to happen. These innovations take a long time, and in order to do something that takes a long time, you need a long, a long string of people and capabilities that are able to shepherd things forward from very nascent understanding of what is going on and how things work, to um, engineering that to do something that is fit for a particular purpose, and, um, and, and then finally to turn that into a product or a service that can actually provide that value to the people who want to use it. The, the important thing about this prize is it helps in um, providing those people who are going to do that highly skilled work of taking research and doing engineering and building products and developing services. It gives them an aspirational goal to reach for early in their career. And uh, we think as a company that Aspirational goals are really important. We do that a lot in the aerospace industry. We set aspirational goals for ourselves that are beyond what we think are capable of today in order to have and work towards a better tomorrow. So as we look to expand our role working with the CQE, we felt this was a natural place to put our efforts and our energy and, our, and some of our money behind 
to support the community in developing and setting out this aspirational goal for those people who are just starting their careers, to give them something to work towards, and in giving them something to work towards, giving them something to work beyond. So please join me in thanking those people who have applied and who've done the work and who we're going to hear from today. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, we look forward to doing this for years to come. OK, so uh, our first section is going to be on quantum information and networks. So I will be one of the moderators. And Chris Anderson, who's actually one of our former prize winners, is going to be our secondary mon uh, moderator. And so our first presentation is going to be from Shrujan Masala, who's a postdoc currently at Caltech. So please take it away. It's working? Is it working now? Yes, it is. All right, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Sturgeon. I'm a postdoc in the group of Oscar Painter at Caltech. Um, and the title of my talk is Quantum Entanglement Between Single Optical and Microwave Photons. Um, this is some very recent progress uh, that we've achieved in our group and I'm very excited to share it with you. More broadly, my interests are in uh, trying to connect different quantum information platforms together um, to leverage their individual strengths and see if we can solve some of the big problems um, en route to building larger uh, and more controllable quantum systems. So the work that I'll talk about today, um, it arises in the context of superconducting qubits. Um, so these, as uh, many of you in the audience would know, are one of, currently one of the leading platforms um, for quantum computation. Um, Many of you would have heard of the uh, very exciting demonstrations of quantum advantage with this platform uh, on specific tailor-made computational tasks. Um, and there are several crucial technical strengths with this platform which have allowed it to make this breakthrough. Um, so in particular, um, you can get very strong interactions between individual qubits that are controllable um, and you can do this at scale because these are microwave frequency circuits um, that are patterned using standard microfabrication techniques um, on a silicon chip, for example. Um, and you can do this uh, at a scale of, you know, uh, currently several hundreds of qubits and maintain a reasonable level of coherence. Um, so as these systems continue to scale towards you know, more complex quantum processors for the grand goal of a fault-tolerant quantum computer, um, there are several technical challenges that come up. Um, so for example, they might be related to how you can pack a large number of qubits on a single chip or a microwave package without degrading coherence. Uh, they might be related to the complexity of the control and readout wiring used to interface with these systems. Um, and so one very exciting research direction that's come up in the last several years is to start thinking of modular um, superconducting um, systems. Um, and in particular, there's been very exciting progress on making good uh, microwave interconnects uh, between modular superconducting systems, uh, both on the you know, tens of centimeter scale in the same fridge as you see on the left-hand side, and also this very impressively engineered uh, cryogenic tunnel, if you will, uh, between separate dilution fridges. Um, now there are very likely practical constraints in terms of the length scale and the uh, density that you can get with those types of interconnects uh, because of constraints on cryogenic systems. And so one way to address that problem is to take inspiration from how you build classical modular computers. So supercomputers and data centers um, use optical communication channels uh, between microwave frequency processors. A quantum version of that would essentially be a network um, where in each node of the network, um, you have a superconducting processor of you know, sizable complexity and uh, processing power, and then you use low loss room temperature optical channels uh, between these cryogenic nodes um, and crucially, uh, at room temperatures, uh, you know, optical photons uh, are not impacted by thermal noise in the channels, unlike microwave photons. Uh, so this is a very powerful vision. Um, and these ideas of quantum networks are not new. In fact, a lot of the 
uh, early building block demonstrations were done um, with other systems. They were done with atoms and trapped ions in the early 2000s. And in the last decade, there was a, a similar wave of demonstrations with solid state emitters, uh, color centers, and quantum dots, uh, where uh, we're now able to um, entangle um, qubits at long distances using optical photons. Um, now, one thing that uh, these systems have, the ones on the left-hand side, um, is a very um, natural interface between light and a matter qubit in the system, for example, an electron spin. Um, this is not natural for superconducting qubits. Light doesn't talk coherently with superconductors. In fact, it does the exact opposite. Um, it spoils coherence, typically. Um, and the question then is, how do you engineer um, entanglement between superconducting qubits and optical photons? This is really the first thing you need in each node um, in order to start, uh, even start thinking about such networks. Um, and so you need a, a device in between that can do that work, a so-called quantum transducer. Um, and this um, uh, realizes a nonlinear interaction process, um, for example, a three-wave mixing process, where a strong optical pump can be used to perform frequency conversion between single microwave and optical photons, or it may be used to uh, realize a parametric down conversion process where you produce single optical and microwave photons in pairs. Um, these interactions are you know, fundamentally you know, at the heart of classical um, electro-optic converters um, in um, you know, technology today. The challenge is you need to do this with single quantum particles, uh, so not with like microwatts or milliwatts of power that we put in ELMs in our lab, uh, but with single optical and microwave photons. And you need to do this in a cryogenic environment where you can't send in a lot of optical power. Um, and what that does is it reduces the efficiency or scattering probability for this nonlinear process to a low level. Um, and you can have various technical sources of noise, for example, light, very small amount of light absorbed in your superconducting circuit, um, which hosts microwave states that are five orders of magnitude lower in energy than even a single optical photon. Um, those states can be destroyed, or the quantum nature of those states can be destroyed uh, by such uh, parasitic effect effects. So uh, this field of quantum transduction is about a decade old right now, uh, and people have been trying to tackle these very hard challenges with a variety of approaches. So you can use an electro-optic um, effect uh, to use a chi-2 nonlinearity in a material, or you can engineer that chi-2 nonlinearity using something in between light and microwaves, uh, for example, mechanics, which is what we do in our lab. Um, but because this problem is very hard um, to do quantum nonlinear optics across this vast energy gap, um, a lot of these approaches have primarily uh, been, op, uh, been um, you know, in this regime where you're really just doing classical frequency conversion. Um, there's been progress on efficiency and noise, uh, but they're really um, in that regime. And we've uh, recently managed to break past that regime and actually see quantum effects between individual microwave and optical photons with such a transducer. Um, and so we do this in a chip scale device with a number of uh, carefully engineered components, which I'm gonna try to walk through um, on the slide. So up top there is a uh, schematic of the chip. Um, I'll show you exactly what it looks like um, shortly. But we launch uh, optical pump pulses um, into a transducer device, uh, which is very tiny compared to the superconducting circuit. Uh, but that transducer has optomechanical and piezoelectric components. Um, the optomechanical component is realized in silicon, so it's like a nano beam, which is patterned with holes, uh, which are carefully designed. So you can confine light at the telecom wavelength and acoustic vibrations at a microwave frequency of five gigahertz in the same volume. And when you do that, um, you can use the radiation pressure of light in this structure to engineer a parametric interaction uh, that allow you to produce single optical photons and single microwave phonons in pairs. You can then convert the phonon into a superconducting microwave circuit, which is resonant with the acoustic mode uh, via a piezoelectric interaction. And we achieve that with a uh, compact piezoelectric component, which is shown in green um, over there. Um, and that's physically attached by design to our silicon optomechanical uh, resonator. Uh, and crucially, another important aspect of this device is that we engineer uh, the superconducting circuit and the layout um, to minimize the impact of 
small amounts of optical absorption. So in particular, we work with niobium nitride, um, which has a fast relaxation time scale for quasiparticles uh, produced by absorption of light. Um, and for the experts, uh, we also work with thin films of niobium nitride, which give us high kinetic inductance, which is crucial to get a large coupling strength for the piezoelectric interaction. Um, and uh, that gives us high efficiency for you know, taking a single phone on in the acoustic mode and putting it in the microwave output um, of the device. Um, so from a quantum optics standpoint, you can describe this device uh, with uh, three modes. Uh, you have a two-mode squeezing interaction between the optical and acoustic mode, A and B. Uh, and simultaneously, you have a beam splitter interaction uh, between the acoustic and electrical circuit modes, uh, B and C. Um, and you can, uh, via the action of these two interactions at the same time, you can produce microwave and optical photons in pairs. You can go a step further. You can excite the device with two time-delayed pump pulses. And you can produce entangled microwave and optical photon pairs. Uh, and the entanglement is between photonic qubits in the microwave and optical ports, which are defined using this uh, time bin degree of freedom, whether a photon comes early or late. This is what the actual chip looks like uh, that we're working with right now. It is a one by one centimeter chip on a silicon on insulator substrate with these other materials that I talked about uh, earlier. Um, and we come in with a lens optical fiber, as shown on the left-hand side, which is aligned to the tip of the optical waveguide of the transducer that we want to probe. Uh, the waveguide uh, is about a millimeter long in order to distance the microwave circuit um, from uh, small amounts of optical scattering um, at the edge of the chip uh, when you bring in the fiber. Uh, that's one of the uh, many uh, you know, technical uh, details that allow us to um, you know, preserve entanglement. And uh, we wire bond this chip to a PCB. We uh, you know, mounted in a microwave package and uh, loaded into our sample assembly, which also has uh, three uh, nanopositioner stages, which allow us to precisely align this optical fiber. This entire thing sits on the mixing plate of our dilution fridge at about 20 millikelvin. So the uh, experimental measurements that I'll, uh, I'll probably go through too quickly um, uh, are geared to detect these correlations uh, between single optical and microwave photons. Um, and on the optic side, uh, we uh, detect single photons um, using SNSPDs. Um, and importantly, we filter out the pump pulses reflected from the device before we do that with very high extinction. That's one of the key enablers for these measurements. Um, and on the microwave side, what's more natural is to do heterodyne detection uh, by routing the microwave state into a, um, uh, an amplifier. We use a near quantum limited parametric amplifier, which adds about two and a half quanta of noise uh, uh, through the amplification process. Um, and importantly, we can infer the characteristics of the microwave state coming out of the device if we independently measure the moments of this noise that's added by the amplifier. And we can also perform tomography of the microwave quantum state coming out of the device um, if you invert this um, input-output relation of the amplifier. So this is a first experiment that we did with this device. These results are up on the archive now. Um, so the top panel um, shows a histogram of optical detection events uh, when you pump this device with optical pump pulses at about a 50 kilohertz rep rate. Um, we see that on every experimental trial, you get a click probability or a, a overall system efficiency from device to detector of three times 10 to the negative six. So that means that you get a photon click every seven seconds, roughly, in the experiment. This is about a factor of two faster now, um, um, which heralds you know, the generation of one of these pairs. And when you get a click, if you look on your microwave output port, what did I get? Um, you get that purple intensity trace on average, um, which is about a factor of four higher than the red trace, which is what you get if you don't care whether you got an optical photon or not. Um, and you can go a step further, and you can look at the second order moment of that microwave field when you get an optical photon. And that is less than one, which is a very characteristic signature of non-classical correlations uh, between uh, the two fields. Uh, we went another step further recently, uh, this, these are some fresh results, uh, where we performed the entangled pair generation sequence that I talked about earlier. 
Um, and depending on whether you get an optical click at early or late time, or a coherent superposition of early and late times, which we create with a time bit interferometer, uh, we can characterize the microwave state coming out of the device. And the correlations that we see are characteristic of a Bell state uh, between these two modes. And importantly, the fidelity of that state um, is significantly above 50%. So we're pretty excited by this because this is showing the, the first enabling ingredient that you need in a node in order to think about uh, doing entanglement distribution using optical photons. Um, I'm going to skip this because I'm probably approaching time. Um, but crucially, the performance is also in a regime now where we can do at least a proof of principle experiment where you can entangle superconducting qubits in two dilution fridges um, via uh, single optical photon measurements. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm not aware. I have a few minutes left. OK, maybe let me. Um, go back here for a second um, and give some perspective on the performance of these devices. So on the left-hand side here is the very first realization of this type of transducer uh, in the painter group um, at Caltech, um, and where a transmon qubit was uh, directly connected to the type of uh, transducer device that I showed you. Um, and uh, we've moved to uh, the system on the right-hand side, and there's two big differences here. So one is a very regime-changing difference, which is on the left-hand side, the qubit state is instantly destroyed by the optical pump. On the right, we're moving to a modular system where we make the transducer on one chip, and we want to connect it to an independent superconducting qubit module. And that lets you be more creative with the superconducting circuit. And you've made these light, robust elements, which allow you to preserve the quantum state of the circuit and therefore preserve entanglement. Um, another nice thing that comes out of this is that the rate at which you get optical events has gone up by about a factor of 300. Um, from this previous work. Um, so um, I think uh, we're going to see some very nice advances um, with this device platform in the coming years, uh, because not only are we now in this regime where we've shown this entanglement in principle, um, but we also understand the main technical bottlenecks um, with the system um, and how what we need to work on to sort of improve this. So it's pretty realistic that um, we should be able to reach um, kilohertz level entanglement generation rates per device. Um, another, another thing that I'm excited about is that this is a chip scale device with a relatively small footprint, so you can leverage uh, multiplexing sleeves to also boost these um, entanglement rates. Um, I want to save the bulk of this um, outlook slide maybe for the discussion section, but I want to importantly thank um, first of all everyone who made this incredible um, event happen in the last two days. Um, and my teammates, um, Stephen, David, and Piero in the Painter Group, uh, this was a result of a very tight-knit collaboration, all of the work that I talked about. Our amazing theory collaborators here at UChicago, Liang Jiang and uh, Chang Chun Zhang. Uh, we work with the group of Matt Shaw at JPL uh, for thin film deposition of niobium nitride in our fabrication process. Um, and yeah, we have an um, archive preprint up on this. Um, so if you want more technical details, or you can also catch me uh, later today. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Shujan, for that really interesting talk. Are there any questions? There are lots of questions. Um, let's start with Melissa first. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I just go up the timeline? Okay. Uh, so the, the ideal thermal statistics will go to two. Do you understand the origin of your parasitic clicks? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, basically, it's, uh, there's two sources of noise in our system. Uh, and one of them is significantly higher from more detailed measurements. Uh, uh, the main source is absorption of light in that silicon optomechanical crystal. So silicon is transparent at the telecom wavelength in principle. But even a very small amount of absorption that you get um, can generate enough noise um, to uh, you know, show up and degrade uh, the quantum statistics. Um, so in the measurements that I showed you, we were getting about 0.1 quanta of thermal noise um, every time we do this experiment. And that's what uh, uh, the state that also gives you the G2 of 2. Uh, OK. 
You want to try just yelling? Sure. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your comment about small footprints. I was looking at the Connecticut Is that big square And that looks pretty big. Like the community church space is in limited. I think, uh, yeah, I should qualify that statement about small footprint. You know, it's small in the sense of microwave circuits. Um, so it's small compared to a transmon qubit, for example. Um, but kinetic inductance does allow you to make these compact because, um, you know, you are shooting for, our design shoots for very high impedance in order to get a large piezoelectric coupling. And that, uh, by design, that pushes you towards a small footprint. Yeah. Which is good if you want to make many of these with low crosstalk, yeah. Okay, very fascinating stuff. I, I have questions about your density matrices. So when you drive this parametric process naively, I would expect you get a two-mode squeeze state. So am I right that it's the single photon detection that projects you into, this, uh, into the Bell states? And, and um, so if you look at the density matrices, it looked like you had a very high population in the vacuum, yes. but still the fidelity was like 80%. Yeah, so that fidelity, I had a, a little qualifier there. That fidelity is after post-selection. And, and, so um, yeah, and then my question is how often, when you send, every time you send a pump, a pulse, yeah. how often do you get the uh, um, ideal Bell state? Or how often do you get the uh, selected event? Yeah, so there's, uh, uh, there's single optical photon detection, right, which is post-selecting for single photons on the optical side. So that is the, you know, very inefficient process, which is, you know, when people say transducers have low efficiency, that's the efficiency that's low. That's, uh, in these experiments, that's about, you know, f uh, five times 10 to the negative six overall, um, like device to detector. Um, there's also loss on the microwave side, which is a lot lower. Um, um, it, that is about 50% in our current device. And I think that can be engineered to be uh, close to 100% in like subsequent iterations with some device, uh, design changes. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah you can go. Well, uh, someone's coming with a mic. Yeah, could you maybe say, maybe I misunderstood, but this is an optical to microwave transduction, but if you want to do the reverse process of microwave to optical, is that at all covered by this trip, or is that an entirely different process? Yeah, so you would uh, just, in our device, you can, do that, you can do that reverse process just by operating at a different pump wavelength. Um, so we've also done that. We've done frequency conversion, and to first order, the efficiency and noise of both <laughs> approaches are roughly the same. Uh, this approach gives us some technical advantages in the near term, um, which is why we're pursuing it at the moment. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you, for your scheme, you require uh, two coupling rates. So one from optical to mechanical and the mechanical to microwave. What's limiting those rates? And is that something that you see that can be improved in future iterations of the device? Yeah, it's a very good question. So the, the first coupling rate is actually parametric. Um, so it's dictated by how strong you can pump the device. Um, um, and I think uh, that's sort of intertwined with uh, this noise process that I was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, we currently operate at uh, power levels that are two to three orders of magnitude lower than you know, previous work on these silicon optomechanical devices. And so there's some other noise sources in the system that we're trying to understand more carefully. The piezoelectric coupling, that's actually honestly very easy to increase. Um, you can just make a bigger, bigger piezoelectric element or you can use a, a we used aluminum nitride. Um, you can use lithium niobate, for example, and bump that up. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. You can think of, oh, you can think of them for the panel later. So let's thank Shrujan again and Chris will welcome the next speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Chris, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I'm really, really excited to be uh, here for multiple reasons, one of which is on this very stage, I was a prize winner last year, so it's exciting to be back. And number two is I have the pleasure of introducing Melissa Gudry from my old group at Stanford, who's really been leading a lot of our efforts in uh, multi-mode squeezing and interesting nonlinear optics that can be done with silicon carbide, one of my favorite materials. And Melissa has really been sort of leading those efforts and has really been a powerhouse in the field and is very well deserving of this award. She's currently a postdoc with the LNI at Stanford, and I'm really, really excited to see what she's been up to in the past few months. Melissa. 
Thank you, Chris, uh, for the introduction and the shameless exaggeration, uh, and also for listening to my talk uh, for maybe the 10th time. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a system that is quite different in flavor, but the physics is actually a bit similar to what we've seen before, and I'll highlight the similarities as I go on. Um, so really, this project is about studying the quantum physics of optical pulses in integrated photonics. So to start, uh, let's just remember what a pulse looks like. So a basic schematic, uh, you have this envelope in time, and then you can also look at the Fourier transform, and you have this specific uh, spectral width. Now, when a pulse is going to be traveling through an optical medium, it's going to experience some specific effects. Now, one effect that we're all quite familiar with is uh, optical dispersion, right? So you have a wavelength-dependent refractive index, right? You remember that you send white light through a prism, you get a rainbow. OK, this is familiar. And it manifests as a chirp in your pulse, so different frequencies will travel at different speeds. Now, a material property that we are not so familiar with is the optical nonlinearity. For the most part, we're not familiar. Um, and what this is doing is in your wave equation, you're having higher order terms. Now, it turns out that uh, the third order optical nonlinearity of the medium is going to create an effect that looks opposite to what dispersion is going to do when distorting your pulse. And so for a very specific pulse shape, known as an optical soliton, this pulse will travel through this third order medium and it will experience no distortion. It will come out on the other side uh, without any perturbation. So you can imagine what this looks like just traveling in some infinite silica fiber, but imagine taking this fiber and wrapping it on itself and building a ring resonator. Now, in reality, this resonator is going to have some loss. So as you're going around and around, uh, the pulse is going to decay. So imagine we bring in some bus waveguide and we start uh, lining up a pulse source to refresh our pulse on every round trip. Now, when we do the Fourier transform of this temporal shape, instead of just seeing that clean temporal envelope, now we're uh, picking it off with comb teeth that have the spectral width of your resonator. So this is not too surprising, this frequency comb. But what is, is imagine that instead of pumping with pulses, we're now going to be pumping with a monochromatic source, um, a coherent state, a laser. Uh, so this is going to have no sort of temporal or spatial structure in the ring. But if the conditions are right, you're going to create pulses. You're going to create these solitons, these frequency combs. And this is a phenomenon that's been studied in integrated photonics for about a decade now. So actually still kind of fresh, uh, depending on your time scale. Um, so what's going on? How do we gain structure from something that is unstructured? Um, so to do this, you need some sort of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So uh, if we look a little bit closer, uh, what we can do is we can draw the resonator modes of our ring on uh, this little plot. Every mode is a tick. And we can just start driving one of these modes with a strong coherent state. As you inject more and more power into the ring, um, and you look closer at the Hamiltonian, you're going to see that you have this four photon interaction. So two photons are destroyed to create a pair of photons. We saw that same parametric uh, term in the last talk. But here, instead of having two very different energy scales for your pairs of photons, now they're some, on a very similar energy scale, just around the pump mode, uh, separated by some integer multiple of the free spectral range. So as you drive more and more power, you go from having this highly squeezed state, these spontaneous photons, into something that's stimulated. So the coherence of the cavity goes to the coherence of the laser. Uh, it's, it's very similar to a laser threshold. Uh, and what happens is you'll instantaneously fill out a classical comb. You can drive another optical parametric oscillation threshold process at the technical term, fill out more combs. Uh, teeth, and then eventually, if the dispersion and power is right um, for the given detuning, so all these parameters come together, then you can experimentally access this uh, soliton known as a dissipative Kerr soliton. Um, and it's characterized by the fact that you have these equidistant comb teeth that are phase locked together, 
And you can already imagine all the technological applications for a phase-locked equidistant comb, right? Spectroscopy, metrology, frequency synthesizer. Uh, people are using it for telecommunications, where each uh, tooth in the comb is actually an information channel. So this has really inspired the integrated, nonlinear integrated photonics community for the last, as I said, decade. Um, but besides technology, there's just a lot of rich physics here. So you have this, okay, it's technical. You have this nonlinear Schrodinger equation with drive dissipation and detuning. And remarkably, it's been able to predict uh, a lot of exotic phenomena that happen in these micro rings. So on the left and on the right, you see experiment and simulation where the y-axis is just the spatial distribution in the ring of this uh, going from no structure to structure all these pulses that can merge, collide, annihilate, and more than just having a single pulse state, you can have soliton crystals, so uh, a crystallization of pulses in the ring. You can have dark pulses. Um, and then, of course, people, because we're doing integrated photonics, you can start carving out the resonator and making some very interesting states. Now, uh, despite the fact that the nonlinear classical physics is so interesting, uh, what was surprising to me is that there has been no study of the quantum physics of these states. And it's surprising, as I said, because there's been so much interest classically, but it's also surprising because, as I showed before, the transitions between these specific states are processes that have very strong quantum correlations, right? This pair generation term can create a very high degree of squeezing. So it seems like there's something interesting here. So the purpose of this study was to identify a model that we could use to study the quantum physics of these solitons, and then to extend that model and see, is there something interesting in the structure? And can we actually learn something about the classical state from the quantum model? And I'll just check my time. OK, so um, that was kind of abstract. Um, but we are experimentally measuring all of the things that we want to predict. So what are we going to use? We're going to use our integrated photonic micro rings. So here you can see an array of rings, and um, here we're working in silicon carbide, but in principle you can use any material with low propagation loss and a sizable third order optical nonlinearity, silicon nitride. At some wavelengths you could use silicon. Um, but here, what we're doing is we have a ring that's equipped with a bus waveguide, and then we have these two orthogonal vertical couplers that we can couple light in and out of the device. So we couple in our monochromatic pump, and then we collect on the other side the states that we want to study. So here you can see um, an example of an experimentally measured comb on the top. So there's two different things I want you to see here. The first is that we have um, these lines that fill the entire comb, but they're at very different powers. So in all of the even teeth, you have this very strong coherent state, that's the classical comb, and then in between you have this orders of magnitude, I mean six orders of magnitude weaker lines, and that is your spontaneously generated parametric pairs of photons that are being built from interactions all across the comb. So this highly multi-mode squeeze state, but I'll get to that. So this state is known as a soliton crystal. So instead of having one pulse going around the ring, now you have two pulses going around the ring, always with the same spatial temporal separation. And it's, as I'm going to show you on the next slide, uh, the Hamiltonian creates a very interesting multi-mode interaction because you not only have pair generation, but you also have uh, these lattice hopping terms that come from something called Bragg scattering. So what we wanted to do was validate a model. So what we're going to do is two photon correlation measurements all across the comb. Um, so here you can see, uh, again, a thermal state going to two, <laughs> okay? Um, so this would be an autocorrelation, um, but then you can also look at cross-correlations. And what we're gonna do is measure all these correlations and then compare it to our approximate model. So we take the maximum value of all these correlations and then we plot it. So that's what you see on the right. Every mode number uh, has a paired uh, measurement uh, for every, uh, line in the comb, and then we compare it to the model and we see quite good agreement. So uh, we validated our model, but why was this contentious to start? So if we look back at the full Hamiltonian, as I said, this is a four-photon interaction, annihilate two photons, create two photons. 
So that means that we have a quartic term in our Hamiltonian. And for me, that's computationally intractable. So I would like to solve a Hamiltonian that creates linear coupled mode equations, so quadratic in the bosonic operator. So what can we do? Well, the reason that we chose to study this soliton crystal state is because it creates a very neat partition between strong classical mean field and the spontaneous pairs of photons that we want to study. And it also means that we don't have to worry about coherent light uh, basically washing out our G2, right? Because coherent light should have uh, no temporal correlations. So what we can do is say, OK, we're only going to look at terms that are quadratic in the strong classical mean field. So we just take their operators, turn them into complex amplitudes, and then they drive spontaneous pair generation and lattice hopping within the comb. So we have this nice multimode Hamiltonian. Uh, then the question is, what can we do with it? So uh, what I wanted to know was, what is the squeezing structure of the spontaneously generated light? because all these uh, OPO transitions can create very strong correlations. Uh, but when you look at the Hamiltonian, it, is, it isn't so clear. So uh, one thing we can do is just remove these other terms, and then you can see that you have a very simple diagonalization of the Hamiltonian into these orthogonal squeeze super modes, so just some linear combination of native uh, uh, comb modes. And this is exactly the structure that's been measured um, when you take a chi 2 cavity and you, you pump it with a pulse train. You're exactly going to have squeezing along these diagonal Hermite Gauss squeeze super modes. This has been studied and, and measured. Um, but we have to keep these terms. And so what can we do? Well, it's a bit technical, so I'll go fast. You just have an input output transfer matrix in your quadrature basis, and then you can decompose the matrix using a block Messiah decomposition, and all of the squeeze super mode information is encoded in these matrices. Okay, so we numerically uh, calculate the state using what's known as the Lugiato Lefevre equation, that nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And what we do is we do this decomposition on all of the states that are along the existence region of the soliton crystal, so that nice quiet step. And what we find is that the squeezing is very, very high uh, in the highest mode, and then we have a sharp increase right at the transition from a soliton crystal to a single soliton. So every other line is coherent to every line is coherent. And when we look at the squeezing structure, we see that it is certainly multi-mode. So you have to consider uh, this linear combination of modes all across the comb. And we see, um, it's, it's quite unique, but it's technical, uh, the squeezing structure that you have this dominance of the second order Hermite Gauss mode. And the way it actually manifests is that um, when we look at this strong mean field, you also have the squeezed vacuum pulse that's in the orthogonal uh, frequency modes riding around with that strong mean field. And it has this sort of dimpled shape and that's exactly explained by the fact that you have this strong gain in these two Hermite Gauss modes. Um, we can look at the stability diagram and see that, okay, it's not just one uh, simulation that you run, but everywhere that the soliton crystal exists, you see the same behavior of strong level squeezing and then a sharp increase at the end of the step. And this is quite interesting because it seems to be reminiscent of a typical OPO threshold right, where you can, I mean, OPO is what people use to generate very high degrees of squeezing. I think we're going to hear from a LIGO person in the next session, but um, it's, it's a very classic uh, source of squeezing. Um, but it's, uh, it would be strange if this was an OPO threshold, because rather than having the whole power of the system increase through the threshold, you actually have a halving of the power, because one soliton has to disappear. And then the question is, why? Um, how does the system even choose which soliton disappears? Um, so to answer that question, um, if it is indeed an, a threshold process, then we know that uh, you're going to have a binarization of the phase when you go above threshold. This is what's used to create coherent icing machines. Uh, and the way that we can confirm this experimentally, well, you can measure the squeezing, but you can also just look at the coherence broadening. Of, of any sort of autocorrelation, and that's going to encode the degree of squeezing of the system. Um, we're doing integrated photonics. I have to skip this. Maybe I can talk about it in the panel. But 
Um, there's a way that you can very strongly outcouple the squeezed vacuum pulses from your resonator, and then you could build a practical uh, pulse squeezing source just using a photonic architecture, mold it, do a homodyne measurement, and, and use it for um, any technology that you think it might be applicable to. Uh, and finally, I just want to close out that I've chosen a very specific subject, dissipative Kerr solitons and integrated photonics. Um, but I think generally this is a very interesting time to be doing nonlinear quantum optics um, because with the maturity of integrated photonics, rather than just trying to reproduce tabletop experiments on a chip, we're now actually studying new physics because of the very small mode volumes, because of the very high quality factors. And I'm very excited to see um, what comes next for our field. Um, so finally, I want to acknowledge the rest of my team, my collaborators, of course, our fab, our clean room, um, and uh, the organizers and everyone who's contributed to the summit. Thank you. Questions from Melissa in the back there. Yeah, okay, again, very interesting. So I was curious about the last slide about the non-Gaussian uh, state. How, yeah. w w what uh, state is that and how would you implement it in your, in your uh, uh, ring resonator? Okay, so are you familiar with the work of Ryotatsu Yanagimoto and Edwin Ng? Okay, so. No, not really, no. Yeah, so um, they are really pioneering the theory behind ultra-fast pulses in these integrated photonics platforms. And uh, this was a paper that they put out recently where they were studying uh, mesoscopic pulses in periodically pulled lithium niobate waveguides and how they can actually develop non-Gaussian uh, physics uh, during propagation. I don't study that. That involves a second order nonlinearity. Um, but the idea is that when you aren't having that very strong mean field, um, you're already at the level where your G over kappa, for, for not very many photons, what you would be able to see non Gaussian physics. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. More questions? Yeah, just, just uh, speak loudly, please. Photonics uh, uh, cone in very uh, visible light or even UV? Yeah, so that's an ex excellent question. Um, so there's this entire field, uh, part of our field, that's just trying to push combs into the visible and UV. Um, of course, what you're going to run into is now you have band gap issues for most of the powerhouse materials that we want to use. Okay, so your band gap allows you to operate at visible, but a lot of these combs require you to uh, have, you know, relatively high input powers to even see the comb, right? And at that point, you're running into two photon absorption. So people are beginning to look at more exotic materials that have even, uh, you know, wider band gaps. Uh, I think sapphire could be very interesting. The challenge there is that the nonlinearity drops. Um, but yeah. In the classical side of our field, it's a very highly uh, interesting problem. Is there another question in the back? Oh, there you go. Thank you for the great talk. I was wondering uh, if you change your material from Chi 3 to Chi 2, is there any physics changing uh, in the description? Um, yeah, so it's a very good question. Um, so I showed you the synchronously pumped OPO. Um, and its solution to its Hamiltonian, that's what the Chi 2 with Combs is going to look like. Um, and what you're doing is you're removing this lattice hopping term uh, because that's born from Bragg scattering, and you're not having that same term in Chi 2. And also, the detunings that your modes are going to see is slightly different because you are not having um, that very strong cross phase modulation on the same um, strength. You, still, you probably still have to take it into account, um, but I think the dominant term is going to be that chi 2 pair generation, and that should be like a Hermite Gauss structure. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Any more from the back? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
so you showed uh, an intensity intensity correlation function, and on the last slide, what looked like a quadrature covariance uh, uh, matrix. I'm curious if like your multi-mode squeezing structure can be engineered the relative uh, uh, faces and st strengths of the correlation, so you can get, for example, a multi-mode cluster state or something else that is a particular state of interest. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Uh, so I think that you could play around with two things. Um, one is that you could try to change the comb that forms within the resonator itself, and there you might want to play around with the dispersion. So there's a lot of different ways that people start to engineer the dispersion. You can bring in more resonators to start to create, uh, you know, avoided mode crossings. You can actually modulate the inner radius of your device, and that'll start splitting, um, you know, your your uh, traveling modes into standing waves. Um, you can also, in, instead of doing a continuous wave bump, you could send in a shaped pulse, and then you have like very good control over what state is in there. Those are ways to do it. You still have to uh, deal with the, um, you know, different scalings of the nonlinearity for the, as I said, the lattice hopping versus the pair generation, that's fixed. But the amplitude of the pumps and the phases of the pumps, I think you can control. So I have one final question for you, Melissa. Yeah. So let's say it all works amazingly. You have a pulse squeeze source on chip. What do you want to do with it? That's a really great question. That's not my, the main focus of my research by any means. Um, I think that we're still in a very nascent place um, with the physics here. Um, but we can look to very similar platforms. I talked about the SBOPO. Um, they have proposals for cluster state generation, so measurement-based quantum computing. I'm not so sure how far that will go, but I would really love to see proposals on sensing and metrology, so these areas where classical combs are very useful. And so what happens if we start to have like highly squeezed correlations um, when we do these technologies? Like how can we harness that property of, of the comb? Okay, great. Well, let's all thank Melissa again for her wonderful talk. And then I will introduce our next speaker, who is Pai Peng, who is a PQI, Princeton Quantum Initiative, postdoc fellow with Professor Jeff Thompson. So welcome. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thank the organizers for putting together this great event. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our recent work on high fidelity gaze with erasure conversion in metastable qubits. Okay, so first let me briefly introduce the system that we are working with. We use neutrons trapped in optical tweezer arrays. Uh, this system combines the advantage of uh, optical tweezer arrays that are scalable and uh, reconfigurable, and it also has the uh, features from neutral atoms, such as the strong Rydberg interaction and the long coherence time. And due to these uh, unique features, this has been a really rapidly developing field for quantum simulation and quantum computation. And in this field, many groups, including us, are interested in using uh, atoms called uh, alkaline Earth-like atoms. They have a, a richer energy levels, so they offer unique tools to do quantum control, and they have been demonstrated useful for many applications, including the main circuit operation, high fidelity entanglement, and optical clocks, as you will hear more from the afternoon session from Adam Shaw. Okay, so one of the most unique and interesting feature of alkaline Earth-like atom is the presence of a long-lived metastable state that has been used to, for optical clocks, one of the most precise measurement people have ever done. And in the recent work, we actually show that this metastable state is also highly powerful for quantum computation. And specifically, we work with the atom uh, Ytterbium-171. It has a nuclear spin half, so that naturally forms a good qubit. In the previous work from our group, we have demonstrated that uh, the, if you encode our qubit into the ground state manifold, uh, we see an excellent coherence. And now we have moved our qubit into the nuclear spin levels in the metastable state. Here, we not only inherit the excellent coherence, but also this gives us two additional advantages. First is that when we are doing entangling between atoms, we need to go to this highly excited Rydberg state. And from this metastable state, it's easier, faster to go there, and that's more accurate. 
The other advantage, which will be the focus of my talk, is that um, when we encode qubit here and do a reaper gate, the majority of the error can be converted into erasure errors, which makes this um, um, quantum error correction much easier. So let's see what is a erasure error and why is it preferable. Um, Erasure error is defined as a detectable leakage error, meaning if we have erasure error happen to our atom, the atom will leak out of, uh, out of its um, uh, qubit space into some other state that can be, can be detected independently. For Eterbium 171, that's realized in the following way. So uh, if, if we consider the only fundamental error, which is the finite river lifetime, um, if the atom decays from here, it's very unlikely that we will go back and contaminate your qubit basis. But rather, it either goes to the true ground state that can be directly imaged, or goes to some other nearby river state that can be converted into ytterbium ions and then detected. So from a, a numerical estimation, if we consider only this fundamental error, we think ultimately 98% of the two qubit error can be converted into erasures. Okay, so having seen the physical origin of erasure error in Turbium, what's so nice of it? Let's see, think of this from a simple classical example of a repetition code. Let's say we want to encode one bit of information and we are subject to error. So we do uh, n copies of it and do a majority vote in the end to recover the information. If we have purely computation error, say bit flips, then it's uh, uh, easy to see that we can at the most tolerate half of the bits having this error. But however, if we have erasure error, now the error does not bring 0 to 1, but bring 0 to some other detectable leakage state x. So in this case, we can still recover the information as long as there's one bit that is not erased. And this advantage really comes from the fact that with erasure error, we have the additional information of which atoms have gone wrong. So in this spirit, the advantage also carries to the quantum case. Here's a numerical simulation of the surface code. If we have all the error being computation error, the threshold is well known 1%. Rather, if we have all erasure error, then the threshold can go up to 5%. For the metastable qubit case, we estimate it can boost threshold by more than fourfold which will mean that in the long run, when we have a fault-tolerant quantum computer, by utilizing this erasure error, it can reduce the resource overhead by a lot. Okay, so uh, how to harness the power of erasure error conversion in the metastable qubit? Of course, the first thing is to be able to prepare and read out such a qubit. And we do this by using optical pumping um, which does not require a clock laser and the corresponding magic wavelength trapping, making our scheme um, much easier and more scalable. So specifically, if we want to go from the ground state to the metastable state, we pump the atoms here to here and let it decay. If we want to go back, we pump the atom here and let it decay here, then back to the ground state. In both of the processes, we need to keep a repumper on because this is also another metastable state and we want to prevent atoms from being trapped there. As for this uh, spin state preparation, our natural initialization process actually leads to a spin purity of more than 90%, and we can make it even higher by simply depump the spin minority state and do the pumping again. For the spin state readout, we currently do it in a destructive way, which is uh, blow out spin state one by converting it into the reaper state and then into ytterbium ions, which will fly out of the trap. So throughout this uh, whole process, our overall initialization readout fit that is about 98%. So having established qubit, we can now study its properties and apply control on them. First, we confirm that it indeed has a very long lifetime that's limited by the scattering of the Twitter light. So for most of the experiments, we use a shallow Twitter that gave us a lifetime of about three seconds. And then we also confirm this metastable nuclear spins has uh, almost as good coherence as the ground state counterpart. We also observe second level coherence time. And uh, to do quantum control, we put the atom into magnetic field to split the levels, and we drive resonant RF pulses to do single qubit rotations. For two qubit gate, we need to uh, couple one of the state to the river state, where it has a large electric dipole moment so the atoms uh, apart can talk to each other through this electric 
dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, so other than the qubit, another important ingredient to do error uh, to do erasure error conversion is to be able to detect the leakage in main circuit. And we do this, uh, as I said, there are two leakage channels, one ion, one ground state. As a first demonstration, we are only now detecting the ground state channel. Although it's not a perfect erasure conversion, but as I will show, it already gives some significant improvement on the quantum gates. So we do this uh, using a fast transition in interbeam that allows us to collect enough photons in 20 microseconds, a uh, very short time, and we are able to re reach an imaging fidelity of about 99%. Okay, so having the qubit and the erasure detection channel, we are now ready to answer the most important question for this uh, study, that is, what is our gate error? and how much of the gate error can be converted into erasures. Let's start with a simple example of single qubit gates. Um, so we first um, benchmark our single qubit gate fatality using randomized benchmarking experiment. The idea is also very simple. We just apply a bunch of random Clifford gates with the only requirement that if there's no error, your qubit will go back to its initial state. And the experiments, of course, you're subject to errors and the return probability will decrease as you add more and more gates. So this de uh, decreased rate will basically reflect your gate fidelity. And in this, we will measure our single qubit gate fidelity of 0.1%. Uh, and then we want to ask, among this 0.1% gate error, what, uh, what fraction of it is erasure error? And we check this by interleaving our fast imaging in between the Clifford gates. And if we consider only the cases where we don't see a erasure in any of these images, or in another word, if we exclude the uh, erasure error from our statistics, we see the gate, gate error is dropped by a factor of 0.56, meaning we have 56% of our total single qubit gate error converted into erasures. And another important aspect of doing erasure error conversion is to make sure that by doing this detection, you are not adding more errors to the good qubits than what you can detect for the bad qubits. And we check this by leaving the fast imaging light on throughout this randomized circuit and check the return probability again. We see almost no difference that gives us a bound of this additional error to be less than 10 to the minus 5 per detection. So that's a minimum, a very minimum value. And then let's move on to the more interesting and more important two qubit gate. Uh, so we adopt the state of our time optimal uh, control Z gate, uh, which looks like this. And to benchmark this uh, two qubit gate, we use a similar experiment. But because the lack of independent control, we can only apply symmetric gates on the two qubits. So that does not form a strict uh, randomized benchmarking experiment, but still from a numerical simulation, we see this symmetric random circuit still give a very good estimate of the true gate fidelity. And using this method, we measure a gate fidelity of 98%. Then um, uh, in the same spirit, we just interleave the fast imaging between the random gates and the condition on no erasure is seen, we see the error is reduced by a factor of a third, suggesting we have successfully converted uh, one third of the total error into erasures. And more interestingly here, we see that this erasure error is highly biased, meaning it has erasure error only if we start with the, our qubit start with state one, which makes sense because when doing this two qubit gate, we're only selectively coupling the spin state one into the Rayburg state, where it is most vulnerable to errors. And this biased erasure error will offer even more advantage compared to the normal erasure error for quantum error correction. And uh, this slide is for the experts, so we build a numerical model to try to understand our, our error sources. Um, we have uh, all the parameters independently measured from experiments, and we consider all types of errors that we can think of are present in our gates. Turns out from this numerical model, our dominant error source are two. First is the fundamental error, the Rayburg lifetime, but we also have some technical error, the Doppler shift meaning uh, the atoms are moving and they see a uh, different frequency as we put in because they are 
depends on their moving toward the laser or moving away from the laser. And we also want to understand what limits our erasure conversion efficiency because previously, as I said, our ultimate efficiency would be 98%, and we are now only having a third. And this reason is also twofold. First, um, we currently are only detecting the ground state leakage channel. We don't have the terbium ion imaging capability yet. And the other reason is that um, the 98% was estimated considering only this uh, river lifetime error. But still, we have some technical error that intrinsically have less erasure uh, component. So overall, combining these two factors, we roughly have two-thirds of error being leakage, and we can detect about half of the leakage that give rise to the one-third erasure detection efficiency. And we can make this better by, for example, using a robust gate that can, is intrinsically insistive to Doppler shift or by simply using a higher power laser to reduce the technical noises. Uh, so here's a brief summary of the talk. I've shown a high fidelity metastable state preparation and readout. And also we have built this ground state leakage detection channel. With these two hardware ingredients, we achieve uh, high fidelity gates. And more importantly, we have converted a significant portion of the residual gate error into erasures. And as for the outlook, of course, we're going to push forward our gate fidelity and uh, the um, erasure detection efficiency. And the other aspect is we want to do quantum circuit in a much larger array that will be uh, developed in twofold. First, we want to use an um, integrated FPGA system that can really harness the power of uh, mid circuit uh, erasure detection. We're going to do atom replacement and other conditional operations using our erasure detection result, not just pulse selecting. And the other aspect is that we have built a large-scale optical modulator that would uh, allow us to control an arbitrary subset of the total Twitter arrays. So we have a technical paper that recently posted in the archive if you are interested in more details. OK, so with that, I would like to thank the wonderful team that has done this work. First of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Jeff Thompson, and the fantastic graduate student postdoc, Sho, Genyue, Beach, and Alex. We also have a great theory collaborators team, um, Gudu and Sven from Strasbourg, and Shruti and Jihan from Yale. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? So I have a quick question about while people gather their thoughts. Um, so it seemed to me that your spin state readout was destructive. Yes. Sort of. So can you tell me the limitations of that approach? Does that limit your ability to do things like QND or certain types of circuits? Yeah, so that's like just a first step to try. We already have, a, yeah, like in the next few months, we're definitely going to replace that to do a non-destructive readout. And some people in the field has already demonstrated that. The idea is that we're gonna shield, uh, we're gonna uh, uh, shelf some of the states into uh, the other metastable state and do it uh, uh, in sequence. Uh, currently, it's fine for us, especially for the erasure detection, because those atoms have already gone wrong, so it's okay to just measure them destructively and replace a new one when we have that capability. Okay. Questions from the audience. Okay, so for um, showing the erasure detection, do you also have schemes for doing erasure correction moving forward? Uh, yes, uh, we don't have settled down what uh, specific thing we want to do, but currently we're working on the upgrades, as I said, to take that image mid-circuit and do the replacement also mid-circuit. So we need to have a fast uh, sort of analyzer and also the programmer for the Twitter movement to be able to do that. That's something we are working on. And in the long run, we're going to correct that in the uh, error correction code. Because you also mentioned that here now when you're doing the detection, you think that the fast measurement is actually not detrimental to your setup. If you start to do these mid-circuit measurements, do you anticipate extra loss or you think it'll be okay? 
uh, for the initial detection, actually, we're going to uh, keep doing this destructive measurement. But just for the final spin readout, uh, we're going to replace with uh, non-destructive ones. Let's go to the question in the back. Yeah, just a quick question. I was wondering, um, is this limited to ytterbium, or are there specific benefits for um, erasure detection in ytterbium as opposed to you know, other structures? Yeah, that's a very good question. So at the beginning, when we developed this, we think it's a very nice property unique to ytterbium or alkaline earth like atom. But recently, there are also work from some superconducting qubit groups. They have uh, do a smart encoding, basically their natural uh, error source is not erasure, but by uh, encoding the qubit very smartly, they can convert their dominant error source to be erasures. And I think that uh, gives us a basically very general type of system that you can all try this encoding and harness the power of erasure conversion. And there was a question in the front here. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk, Peng. Uh, uh, could you say what you think the actual likelihood of this like dark state erasure detection with this ion detection actually is? Um, because it seems difficult to do, to do this ion detection. Um, yes, so that's uh, something that we're still trying to model. But uh, I think there's a lot to learn from the trapped ion property, uh, trapped ion uh, community. And uh, we have done a very rough estimation of basically how long does it take for ion to fly you know, to mix up the nearby traps and how fast you can collect photons. Fortunately, this um, uh, ion imaging transition is strong enough, and I sort of think we can collect maybe a few photons that can give us a probably reasonable fidelity to team switch, but it's not going to be like high 99, 39 stuff. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I'm not an expert, so you may have already answered this, but we have a question from uh, our virtual audience. Can you talk a little bit about the time overhead when you do the erasure detection, and does that influence the speed of the experiment? Yes, so uh, that's also a very good question. Currently, the uh, imaging pause is only 20 microseconds, and uh, but it takes a long time to transfer the image from the camera and to analyze it. And if we have to integrate FPGA system, I think that can be done uh, in millisecond or some millisecond time scale. So yeah, as a comparison, uh, our two qubit gate is about uh, microsecond, and single qubit gate right now is also millisecond scale because our RF is slow. So that does sound like a significant portion, although not the dominant uh, time-consuming step. But the hope is that um, if you figure out a smart uh, decoder, you don't need to do it very often. So you, uh, and the idea is that errors are rare, so you can do multiple gates and check the error. So um, in long run, I think that should not be a limitation. Okay, let's thank Pai again for a great talk. So now we're moving on to our final speaker of the session, which is Yuja Zhang, a PhD student at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who is co-advised by Gina Lorenz and Eric Chambar. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm really grateful to be here to share some of my research during my graduate school. So the title will be called Information Science in Photonic Quantum Network, which is quite matched with the session title today. So I'm going to give a really biased perspective from my study previously on a photonic part of quantum network and with a focus on what we can do in network with discussion on communication protocol, sensing protocol, and the explorations of quantum foundations in a photonic quantum networks. So in this biased setting, in the photonic setting, and I think the photonic quantum network should be decomposed into different layers. And from the bottom to the top, we have the physical layers, which describe how many user nodes we have and how they are connected classically or quantumly. And the example of that will be the underground fiber link that we have at the University of Illinois. And if you want to know more information about that, you can check out the QR code over here, which talk about how we are actually launching our first public accessible quantum nodes in the actually few, few weeks ago. And on top of that, when we want to discuss the quantumness of a quantum network, 
we need to design some photonic source. We have to make sure that we have a quantum source that can actually enable different quantum application. So there will be also a lot of discussion related to how to create and engineering the single photon source and photon power source. But the main focus for today's talk will be actually about the application layer. And I'm going to talk about sensing, communication, unfortunately not the computation, but I will give you example to show how in general, in my perspective, how we can look for new quantum application in the futures. So if we want to use some information theoretical tool for this study, then the first thing that we want to do is trying to make some abstraction of all of this layer into the abstraction layer over here, where we describe our photon source as a quantum state, describe the physical channel as some kind of noisy CVTP map, and describing the users as the measurement setting, they can accept different input and get different output. And the essence of the quantum network is actually all encoded in the correlation that we can generate from a quantum network. So in general, if we can get a non cloudable correlation, that's a necessary condition for us to get a quantum enhanced application in network, but it is not sufficient. So we can turn this correlation, we can treat that correlation as a conditional probability distribution and, sorry, as a transition probability distribution. And that could help us to relate this correlation in a communication uh, related quantity, like the mutual information. So we can discuss, discuss communication scenario in these settings. Or we can think about this correlation as conditional probability of the response of the measurement given different unknown parameter. And that can help us to connect this parameter with official information that is important to the meteorological discussions of a quantum network or we can just look at the correlation itself. And that's actually how people do that before, which win the Nobel Prize last year that we use correlation themselves to study the quantum foundations, to study Bill and Kelly and a lot of the studies beyond that. So a good strategy to discuss this network protocol will be try to understand what we have done before in a non-network scenario. And in the communication scenario, from the point-to-point -point communication, we have seen a lot of great application proposed and implemented in the past, which includes the quantum key distribution protocol, quantum teleportation protocol, superdensing protocol, and a lot of different quantum entanglement assisted protocol in noisy environments. And uh, natural generalizations for this point-to-point -point communication protocol in a network setting could be a multiple access channel, which describes a scenario that we have multiple senders and only one receiver. And for example, the, this is uh, the exactly the same communication that communicate our cell phone to your cell towers. There are actually a few discussions theoretically in the past trying to understand how we, are, how we can gain advantage, quantum advantage in this kind of setting, and including discussion on using entanglement sharing between sender to achieve a larger capacity region, or using continuous variable entanglement sharing between sender and receiver to achieve a quantum enhanced communication over noisy channel, or by us, where recently, that we show that even if the resource is just a single particle entanglement, we can show that we will get some quantum enhancement in the communication scenario. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail by setting up the problem first. So if we are discussing a multiple access communication scenario built with one single particle, then we can just use the abstra abstraction layer that I mentioned before. We can describe the source, the encoder and decoder using different quantum uh, terms over here. Well, the source is a single particle, so it is just a density matrix that is sitting at the single particle uh, subspace in the Fox spaces. And the encoder is a spe specific encoder which we don't allow the introductions of new particles, so this will be a constrained encoding. And in the end, when we do the encoding, we get the correlation again. So and we, we are going to understand this correlation in this scenario as the multiple access channel. And the question that we want to ask is, whether we can get some quantum multiprocess channel that is beyond classical, that is not classical simulable, and more importantly, we can answer the question that whether we can use this multiprocess channel, quantum enhanced one, to send more information over, 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 over the same environment. We try to solve this problem using several different approach, information theoretical approach. We build, we construct uh, different types of Bell type inequality. So you can imagine this inequality will set constraint on what you can achieve using classical strategy. And if you can get a violation for this inequality, that's a signature that you can actually generate some non-classical correlation in this setting. But that's usually not enough. We have to do a little bit more to relate this correlation into a more information theoretical quantity. For example, we want to relate the correlation in this scenario 
to the capacity rich regions in multiple access channels. So take the two access channel as an example. The capacity rich region essentially is talking about the trade-off between how many information you can transmit in a two access channel. So if you send more information in standard one, then there are some bound on the information that you can send in standard two. But this uh, capacity rich region, they can be quantified pretty clearly in this multiple access setting by the mutual information, the information theoretical quantity that we are talking about. And this mutual information can be actually directly computed based on our understanding on what kind of correlation can be, gener can be generated in the network. And has, as, as what we have shown, both theoretically and classically, it, it is indeed true that if we are able to use a quantum particle, if we design a specific protocol using quantum particle, we can get a information transmission rate sum over those two channels to be exceed exceeding one, and one is the classical bound. And experimental implementation for this idea has also been done in our group, where we replace the particle source encoding and decoding operations with highly single phonon source and cross different corresponding linear optics components. And in the end, we characterize the channel that we actually built by the, by, by the quantum particle, and we show that actually there are indeed a small quantum violation. So it is not an impressive quantum violation, but this showcases us that we can actually using quantum network to build something that is not, uh, not, not observed before in a standard point-to-point -point uh, communication settings. So this is the first example. And if we want to talk about a different example, then quantum sensing will be a perfect uh, uh, target to discuss. Again, starting from the traditional quantum sensing, in the past, we have actually benefited a lot from quantum technology in sensing different things. In terms of the LIGO project, the quantum reading and the quantum illumination protocol, and also including the super resolution idea of two uh, incoherent two point source. People show that there are actually no real limits if we design the quantum measurement carefully. And this kind of quantum sensing protocol actually have been extended and generalized to a network setting. And people nowadays are discussing a different sensing protocol in network, including the network, uh, including the distributed quantum sensing protocol, including the quantum telescope protocol proposed by Goldsman 10 years ago, and also including some interferometric quantum imaging protocol that also help us to get a better sensing over, uh, the, over the astronomical uh, objects. And for today, I'm going to focus on the quantum telescope one more specifically. So uh, a brief introduction on how astronomical observation was done before, actually it is all related to the relay limits or the resolution diffraction limits over here. So the diffraction limit state that if we want to get a better resolution, an angular resolution in sensing a remote objects, then we want to decrease the sensing wavelengths, or we want to increase the effect effective aperture size of the measurement devices. The most, the two successful uh, implementations of astronomical observation in the past will be actually the single lens uh, uh, protocol. People actually send a telescope in the outer space to do measurements over the galaxy, or, uh, or with the radio interferometry protocol. People actually built an array of telescopes and a global network of uh, radio uh, interferometry to help us to sense in the black hole that happened actually about five years ago. But both of these protocols have their own limitation. The first one, the single lens protocol, they are using a really, they are using a single lens. So the effective, the effective aperture size of the single lens cannot be increased by too much. But, and for the radio interferometry, due to technical, technical difficulty, the sensing wavelength they are using over there is still at the radio frequency region. So we want to be able to reduce the sensing wavelength by too much. So that's why we are at the stage to try to bring them together to build some optical interferometry. So that is, in principle, using the shortest wavelength that we can control and also effectively have a much larger aperture size and we can put different a telescope on Earth in principle. But there are a lot of technical, te technical difficulty. People have tried that to try to do that in the classical setting, but they realize in the end that maybe they are, th this is exactly the place that we want to bring some quantum technology in to help the imp implementation of such a, such a experiment. And again, setting up the problem in using an information theoretical tool. In this setting, we will discuss the source, since the source is coming from the light, we have no control over that. We will, we will define the source as a weak thermal, weak thermal light. So it's mostly, mostly vacuum, and it has a small probability of having one single photon coming out from the source. 
And all the information about the source intensity distribution is actually all encoded in the readabilities over here in the single photon term. And if we apply different measurement, then we have different way of extracting those information. Take the direct interference scheme as an example. We just bring the photon together to do interference, and we scan the delay to figure out what kind of uh, information is being encoded in the source. And if we want to quantify the performance of different measurement, then we look at the feature information of the corresponding parameter. When we do the calculation, the larger the feature information is, the better the resolution will be, since feature information is related to the mean square error of estimating a parameter uh, while the parameter robot. If we do that calculation for the direct detection scheme, that's the traditional scheme, we will see that actually, in the lossless case, the feature information is quite good. It's, it scales linear in epsilon. Epsilon is a really small number that I should emphasize again. But in practice, it's not feasible due to the fact that when we try to bring photons together from two separate telescopes together over fiber network, the loss is horrible. And we almost get no photon coming out in the end if you want to make some connection, for example, from LA to Chicago. And that's why we always have these kind of scaling factors over here, and that is pretty bad. And this is exactly the place that we want to bring some quantum network and quantum technology to overcome. And the idea of quantum network, uh, sorry, the idea of quantum telescope is as follows. We, instead of bringing the photon together to do interference, we instead distributing a single photon source from the center nodes all the way to the two telescope. It's true that we have to rely on some quantum repeater and also some quantum memory, but just assuming that we already have that since this is the motivation of the, 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 the whole discuss, discussion here for quantum network. If we have those, then in principle we could achieve, we could in principle achieve the scaling of the direct interference scheme without, no, without loss since effectively we will be able to if, if we have a repeater, in other words, in fact, we will, be, we will be able to distribute a single photon source over long distances. So there are a lot of discussion actually is related to that. People show that actually quantum telescope works, then people start asking, how about other protocol? For example, if we do intensity inflammatory, do homodyne inflammatory, do fancy inflammatory, or if we use a different quantum resources, if we use continuous variable uh, quantum telescope scheme, can we get the same performance? And we can, again, using the feature information corner as using feature information as the information quantity to characterize all of this. And it turns out that only in these two, in quantum entanglement-based scheme, we can achieve a feature information that is epsilon scaling. And for all the other protocol, the scaling of the feature information will be worse than epsilon square. Since epsilon is a really small number, and the larger the, larger the feature, information, feature information is, the better the, the estimation, the, the sensing is. The take-home take message over here is that we actually will be able to observe a really impressive quantum advantage if we are able to implement the quantum telescope scheme or the CV quantum telescope scheme with a repeater network. But there are a lot of difficulty. There are no repeater network at this moment, so we are at the stage, actually, we are still at the stage trying to think about, think about different ways to overcome those imperfections and try to modify the scheme. So this, this sort of idea has also been implemented by us experimentally in a proof of principle experiment where we are aiming to comparing different protocol that we just discussed before using the information theoretical quantity, the feature information. And we also try to implement our experiment in a more realistic experiment and using tools that people are using in the classical information, for example, closure phase. That's a strategy that can help us to get around of the turbulence in astronomical uh, environments. So, okay, I only have one minute, one minute left, but I just really want to share my own perspective about how we are going to look for new application. We talk about communication and sensing right now, but there are a lot of new applications that we can start trying to think about. And actually, the study of quantum foundation will be a really good example. And there are a lot of examples nowadays in the in quantum network. So it is different from the original scenario when people study non carry and entanglement. Actually, in the quantum network, we show it, it, there are already examples showing us that we can actually get more and new types of quantum correlation in quantum network. And those new types of correlation, correlation can in principle help us to get a new types of applications. And I have, so this is a general prospect, pr perspective of myself. So what is the essence of quantum correlation, non-classical quantum correlation? If we want to look in for that, then that, that should be a study of looking at both quantum source, quantum channel, and quantum measurements. We have to understand all of those three components better in order to generate the non-classical correlation. And I have contributed a little bit on all direction, trying to discuss non-cardio quantum state, how they can be cardio similarable, 
discussing imperfect quantum channel, how we are going to use imperfect quantum channel together to make that useful, and also discussing the rules of different measurement in generating different non collateral correlations. And the last slide is about why I think non collateral correlation is, is important. The typical example that I would give is that the Bell scenario, actually, the understanding of Bell measurement actually gives us a lot of application in the past already. But we should remember that all non not all non collateral correlation can result in a quantum enhanced application. So we have to be careful there. And network actually provide a new platform to help us to look for new types of quantum correlation. And those quantum correlation actually can go beyond the standard Bell scenario. And in the end, I want to acknowledge all my uh, group mates at both Lorenz Lab and Chilamber Lab at U of I. And I want to thank the organizer again to putting everything together and give us the chance to present over here. Thanks. Questions from the audience? One in the middle here. Hey, Yuji, thanks a lot for that nice talk. Um, in, the, in the beginning with the multiple access channel, mm -hmm. oh. uh, about the experiment, is, is that how much of that is, is the experimental error and how much of that is the actual theoretical separation that you, that you get with that model? Uh, so we get uh, violations that is maybe three to five times greater than the experimental error. And the experimental error consists both the systematic error that due to the instability of the inflammatory and also the statistical error that we have since we won't be able to collect the data over a really long time since the stability of the inflammatory. Other questions? I have one uh, while people are gathering their thoughts. So the scheme is really cool for the quantum telescope, right? That's one of the things that we always mm -hmm. point to as an application. But it seems like what you're saying is the best use case is you interfere the light from space with some local parasource that you have. Yes. So that means you have to match also the frequency of your parasource to some astronomical thing that you're looking at. Yes, but that's typical. Even in the classical astronomy, they actually put a pretty tight future over there. And mm -hmm. they are actually, you can do multiplexing for sure if you want to use a larger bandwidth. But it is true that you have to do tight featuring to match the astronomical source with your lab source. Do you happen to know the sort of astronomer's favorite optical wavelengths? Uh, like what, actually, should, what should we be designing our pair sources to be at? So they actually are in favor of some wavelengths that is close to 800. But that's not the best wavelengths for optical communication in fiber. So there are people talking about how to make frequency, frequency converter to making sure that we have a link that is both good for optical transmission and also for observation. They are in favor of 800 nanometer because if you're looking at the, 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 the spectrums of the thermal light, it is actually picked at a place that is around 500 to 800 nanometers. So that's why they are in favor. And also the technology over there for single photon source is much better developed in the past. More questions? So I have, uh, I have another question. Sure. I guess it's sort of an experimentalist. I mean, I love this image of the fiber coming from Chicago down to, down to oh, Illinois. Yes. I'm just curious, like, what's the expected loss? Uh, so we length? actually haven't got a chance to make a full characterization over the long link, but we do have some characterization from the city of Urbana to the city of Rantoul. So that's around 50 kilometers apart from each other, and the loss is more than 20 dB. So it's quite a lot of loss. So we get less than 1% of photon coming out of, coming out of the fiber. But we are still at a durable region that we can still implement something, but as, as I said, repeater is important for the future network. So we. But Mm -hmm. That number is worse than the number that we would quote, right? Yes, the but number so is worse than the 0.2 dB per kilo. Yeah, per so what's, what's happening there? I guess it's not the best fiber, since we are, we are not using the, the best fiber over here. We have the best fiber actually at the city of Urbana. The underground fiber over there, actually, we characterize it, it's almost the best fiber with 0.2 dB per kilometer loss. But the fiber that is connecting between different cities somehow, some part of them might be a little bit creepy, yeah. So now our life is even harder. Yes, it Great. is. Um, any other questions from the audience? This one here. Yeah, uh, could you comment on the past lens stabilization requirement to be oh, an interferometer? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. So it's, it will be challenging. I mean, especially even in our tabletop demonstration, it's quite struggling. So we build a three telescope setup. 
So it's slightly more than a two types of setup. But in order to make that stabilization, currently we use no reference beam, and it is doable in a tabletop experiment. But I, I believe if we, want, if we want to really implement that in a realistic environment, you will have a lot of reference beam and different stabilization protocol over there to, to making sure you get a better one. But we don't know how good we can get. The lessons that we learned from the lab experiment that is, it is challenging. It's really challenging. And uh, something I can mention is in the classical astronomy community, they, when they build the experiment, actually a lot of part of their uh, connection is not in fiber. It's actually in a vacuum tube. So actually in those cases, the, the stability will be slightly better than everything in fiber. Okay, let's thank you, Jay, again for this talk. <laughs>
Uh, so how to do that in um, a new track and Maria, I think is also uh, something challenging. Maybe it's less challenging compared to microwave because we're already at a visible light frequency, mm -hmm. but we also need some converter and the, the node to you know transfer from a local qubit to a flying qubit. So you bring up uh, squeeze states for quantum computing. Um, so I would say that there's already been a lot of promising demonstrations in that direction. Um, very large cluster states have been demonstrated in an academic setting. And then you have the comp Canadian company Xanadu that is really taking these um, pretty routine devices, right? These third order nonlinearity micro rings and building up these really impressive uh, CV quantum computing schemes using uh, silicon nitride integrated photonics. Um, I, I heard a talk from them, I think it was maybe a year or two years ago, where they were really pushing in the direction of taking uh, many different squeeze sources on a chip and then building up these uh, GKP states for fault tolerant CV quantum computing by doing some uh, kind of post-processing with uh, photon number resolving detectors on a chip. Now, I will say that maybe it's not going to be the uh, highest quality GKP state proposal that's out there. I mean, every year we see um, more interesting proposals, but I do think that the squeeze states of light um, are going to be a very uh, near-term source of, of a very high degree of entanglement. So, yeah, from, from the pers perspective of photonic quantum network, so my, my personal understanding is that you, you always have to use photon. Since if you want to do quantum network, then you have something to connect them, you, then you have to use photon. But photon is not so great because you won't be able to store and do manipulation over them locally at, at, at a different station. So I think one connection that has to be made is like building the transducer to transform photon to microwave, for example, or if we have some other strong coupling system, for example, atoms in cavity, we can actually do better manipulation over photon, like we can do QND measurement over photon, and those actually the maybe to me the most important technology to make a quantum network to be a real quantum network. So this is from the photonic part, and from the quantum information science part, my perspective is that we are talking about building a quantum network nowadays, but actually there are not a lot of good candidates for what we are going to do in quantum network. And one difficulty I can see from the theory side is actually the difficulty of characterizing what we can do with, with classical network comparing with quantum network. So that requires a lot of theoretical studies in trying to understand the quantum network better. Not only maybe in the topic that I'm mentioning over here in terms of correlation, but just in terms of a broader uh, types of information theoretical quantity. If we want to discuss different quantity, then we discuss di different application, we dis discuss different quantity. But that kind of discussion is not so well explored, and they need a lot of theoretical inputs to actually really help us to get the application in network that is resembling maybe the quantum computation protocol that we have seen before in the point point communication channel. Okay. Um... So um, I talked about uh, these transducers and you know, my motivation initially was in the context of this modular quantum computer. Um, I think in the near term, these devices are probably going to uh, find some interesting applications in networks um, where you know, the, the link length is more on the kilometer length scale where people are talking about these long distance quantum networks. Um, and uh, the really unique thing that this platform can bring to that scenario um, is very powerful um, error correction capabilities and high fidelity logic gates you get from superconducting qubits in the nodes of your network. Um, so there currently are not a lot of quantum network platforms that have that. Uh, trapped ions do, um, but with solid state systems, uh, there are proof of principle demonstrations of this with like color centers, for example. But uh, um, uh, this, uh, these capabilities are much more advanced with superconducting qubits. Um, also, there's you know recent demonstrations of uh, bosonic error correction, uh, which maps very well onto the problem of uh, transmitting quantum states reliably um, over long distances um, and correcting for loss and other errors um, in that situation. Um, so I think um, in the near term, that's what I'm excited about. It's not something I touched on very much, uh, 
we already heard a lot about um, sensing um, in UJ's talk. Um, and again, um, I think being able to do um, entanglement purification and error correction in these nodes is going to be crucial to really scale these networks to many nodes or like long distances. Okay, I have a question then. I, haven't see, I don't see anything in the audience, but um, so you all talked about a lot of the benefits of your platforms. What are the limitations of your platforms? And then also, if you had to have like one wish list feature that you could add to your platform, what would that be? Okay, so I don't see any limitation on platform. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's in some sense true because this field is uh, very young. Uh, my data set Soliton is like 10 year old. It's kind of a young field. Our field is like seven year old. So we're still like not fully utilizing the full power of the all the devices, all the technologies. Uh, I think there's a lot of rooms that we can do better. And you can see sort of in this field, people are doing like very diverse stuff, like pushing the gay fidelity and doing simulation and uh, doing main circuit readouts and uh, uh, quantum sensing. So that's like really means that we haven't reached the edge yet. But I would say like there's one thing that um, is sort of a, a drawback compared to other quantum systems like ions or super heavy qubits that is the local control capability. So although we have tweezers that sort of like a, each tweezer for each atom, but they're just naturally not suited for doing at, uh, doing quantum control because the refresh rate is so slow. So people are building different types of uh, uh, optical components trying to address that issue. And we're also one of the group. We have a modulator that can turn on each Twitter, uh, independently turn off each Twitter at a 40 kilohertz uh, rate. And uh, we have that uh, component. We haven't tested it in our experiment with atoms. So I think that's uh, one thing that I would really like to have. So with that, we, uh, I think, really opens the door to, you know, independently controlled optical clocks or simulating many body systems that are inhomogeneous or like doing the quantum gates in a more massively parallel way. So uh, I showed kind of more of a fundamental physics uh, result, but I can interpret the question of, is this the best platform in the context of uh, engineering an arbitrary uh, second order bosonic Hamiltonian? And uh, to maybe you know, build up some interesting uh, multi-mode quantum correlations. And I think that, um, so I touched a little bit on how you can begin to do that engineering in the system that I showed where you have a micro ring and it has this specific nonlinearity. Um, but I think that integrated photonics has a lot more to offer in the type of engineering that you can do. So you can go beyond uh, a ring resonator and you can look at geometries where now um, you can have in coupling and out coupling rates that can be very highly engineered, like Fabry Perot resonators, where you can inverse design the reflectors um, to have certain reflectivities for certain wavelengths. And you can couple uh, different resonator geometries uh, together. You can start looking at photonic uh, crystal cavities. And also, um, as uh, Sherry brought up, uh, you don't just have the third order nonlinearity, you have the second order nonlinearity. And so you can imagine um, building resonators that are not just utilizing some passive material nonlinearity, but you can actually equip them with modulators. And so now you can actually have controllable coupling between uh, these different uh, longitudinal modes, well, I guess azimuthal modes in our case of the resonator, based on a phase modulation and amplitude modulation. And we see that these modulators in lithium niobate are really taking off and, and doing some amazing classical physics. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to take the same thing and apply it to these uh, quantum Hamiltonians. So yeah, for photonic, the, for photonic platform, I think the main advantages for photonics is the fact that it has no interaction with the environment. So that gives us capability of doing experiment in room temperature, and we don't have to worry about the coherent time for most of the time. But it is also the major drawback because of it has no interaction with the system, so we won't be able to actually interact two photons together easily. We won't be able to perform a, a, a two photon gate easily using just linear components of, uh, of, of optics. So if 
you, if, we, if, if there is a wish list that I can add to make the photonic platform to be much more powerful, I think that wish list will definitely include a QND management setup. So if we have a way that we can actually couple the photon to a strong coupling region into some other system, and if, we, if that system can allow us to do QND, for example, then actually a lot of protocol that we cannot do before due to the not, no interaction of photonic setup can actually be done. So, and I think that would be maybe the most important thing that I think will be useful, really useful for photonic platforms. Um, I resonated a lot with Pi's answer. Um, I think with transducers as well, we're very much in a nascent stage um, where the performance of these devices is just starting to cross some of these thresholds um, where we can start doing useful quantum things with it. Um, so it's a very exciting time. Um, so I can tell you at the current stage um, what the limitations are and what I would like is I would love to have and play with better materials. Um, looking at Chris, because this is something Chris is passionate about as well. Um, uh, high quality piezoelectric films, um, uh, playing around with uh, different electrode materials that we use uh, for these uh, piezoacoustic transducers, um, things like that, because I, I think that's what's in, in my platform at least, that is probably what's uh, dictating the noise levels. And I think bringing those down um, is going to be crucial um, to get these um, um, you know, improvements that would really allow us to use this platform in quantum networks. Okay. Okay. Um, Jay is going to get to ask a question because he gave us a bunch of money. <laughs> 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 but we are out of time. Oh, <laughs> so please so, ask your question. So really quickly, each of you have done something that's really quite different, but if you had to choose one of the other's experiments, <laughs> one of yours, which would you choose and why? <laughs> okay, so I'll probably do theory rather than physics. <laughs> you order to not hurt others feeling. No, I'm just, uh, I think it, indeed uh, like this time, there's a lot of uh, theory that needs to be done. Like previously, there are of course algorithms, uh, like, but we're now really at the edge that we can do some degree of uh, logical qubits and error correction stuff. So some of degree of a remote link. So there's a really a gap between the ultimate uh, algorithm that you can use for a fully fault tolerant compu quantum computer and the type of theory or the architecture to build these uh, experiments. So this also require theoretical. Inputs. I think that's something that's also interesting. Uh, for me, I can be short and uh, uh, the quantum astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for me, I think I will pick the transducer part, just trying to connect optics with superconducting super qubits. Since that platform is quite different from the photon one, that it has its own advantage over a lot of things like computation. Computation, that's definitely something that it will be much, much more difficult to do in, in photonic network, photonic platform, but a, quantum, a superconducting platform will be a perfect platform for that. And transducer seems to make some connection between these two, and that may help us to make everything more unified in the future. So. I'm going to join the other non-theorists and say <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I wish I, uh, I had more time to really think about um, um, you know, what we can do um, with uh, these quantum network systems in the near term, um, and also longer term in the context of modular quantum computers, like what are um, the kinds of uh, errors that you can tolerate on these interconnects, um, um, at which point it starts to, um, you know, you start to gain an advantage from your modular system. And I think that's kind of a, a hard, messy problem that's intertwined with a lot of uh, Ex experimental details, um, and that would be very informative in terms of um, what these individual networking systems, like you know transducers or like um, 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 ions, like how good they need to be. Okay, let's thank our panelists for their. <laughs> and Jay will actually hand each of our prize winners their part of their prize. <laughs>